Does anyone still believe in paradise? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jillian Circle. I'm your host, Mario Bonds. And as always, we love celebrating stories of tragedy to triumph for ordinary people who are living extraordinary lives. Now, he wanted to be a pilot, and at first he was told no, but he ended up being able to live his dream becoming a pilot, so much so that he's become an entrepreneur and has founded a private aviation company called Jet It with an amazing story that really shows what grit and hard work can look like. I am so excited to welcome Glenn Gonzalez to the Jillian Circle. How are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm great, Mario. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoyed the, uh, and, and excited about the opportunity to share with you and your, uh, your guests. No, yeah, yeah, and I think, um, and thank you for that. One of the reasons why we were so interested in talking to you is this, my goodness, obviously uh, we wanna talk about the venture related to the way you are hoping to revolutionize uh, private aviation. But if we can start back at the beginning, because I I find it a bit fascinating, right? As a child, you seem to be a go-getter in high school and the fact that you were in in the gifted and talented program and became the VP of the Honor Society, et cetera. Where did that come from? Was it instilled into you, your parents, the determination you showed as a child? Take me back to the beginning, Glenn. You know, Mario, it's it's interesting. There's so many different things that I could point to to say, well, that was a moment in time. Uh, But I guess what was really interesting, all of our first mentors are more times than not our parents or, you know, someone who is in a a, a place of, of seniority, if you will. Uh, but it was the village that raised my sister and I and our church and our school. Um, you know, it was, it, it was all of the people at my church. So it was just my parents, it wasn't just my parents, it was my aunts and uncles. It was uh, the, the men and women at my church. You know, fascinatingly enough, uh, our church had three uh, military academy appointees. Um, today, we have uh, two uh, physicians uh, that were all in the same class as me, a movie producer and writer, uh, a college mm. professor. You know, so it was just kind of this village and this ecosystem of support that we all had. And they were all pushing us to just be the best that we could be, uh, whether that was to win uh, organizational competitions for the church or just to be the best individuals that we could be. So, you know, it started at home and then extended out into that immediate environment uh, with my church, with my teachers at school, and then the competition amongst my friends. And then, and then of course, a lot of language uh, competitions you participate in. What languages do you speak? Uh, I do speak, uh, of course, uh, English. Uh, I'm pretty good at Spanish, and, uh, and my, my daughters and wife are fluent in French. Uh, I understand French better than I speak it, so I'm only uh, trilingual to an extent. Well, kudos to Spanish. I'll say, well, it's un placer de conocerte hoy, y gracias por su conversación. <laughs> Fantastic. So with that being said, obviously, after high school, you decided to parlay into the Air Force. And getting into the Air Force, there was a dream of flying that was temporarily derailed. Take me to that moment and what that felt like, and specifically what, se- what, what was the factor that seemingly was in front of you to derail that dream of becoming a pilot. Yeah, so, you know, my, my sister uh, was able to go off to college and my parents supported her uh, to get into school. Uh, as a lower middle class at best family, um, you know, my parents didn't have money for a school for me. So mm. uh, choosing where to go to school started with, you know, how do I accomplish the things that I want in life? I wanted to play division one college basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was secondary to me getting the absolute best education that I could. Um, if there was a possibility to fly an airplane or to learn to fly or to be close to aviation, that, that was really the third piece. And so the Air Force mm-hmm. provided the best of all three of those. Um, however, my very first uh, appointment as a appointee uh, awaiting for my opportunity to attend the academy was a Department of Defense Medical Evaluation Review Board. Uh, And I go in and the very first station is an eye station. Uh, I sit down and uh, the doctor um, asked me to read what I can see. And of course, I I can't see much of 
the letters that he, he has. And so he adjusts it. Um, and, and I read what I can. And uh, unfortunately, that at the time, the Air Force had a policy such that if you are not naturally 2020, uh, mm. you'll never be able to fly an airplane. And so that kind of derailed it from the very beginning. Oh, wow. Uh, or I would have that opportunity to uh, set foot into a cockpit. Uh, fortunately, wow. that policy changed over time and, and that opportunity presented itself later. But, uh, you know, I, it, it was a little bit depressing, but I felt like I had two of the three um, goals that I was after accomplished. And so it was still the right decision to pursue forward. And that's inspiring to me, right? Because it really serves to the spirit of, 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 of humility or at least self-humility in the sense that you were able to reconcile the fact that, gee, I'm not going to get that third third. First of all, the fact that you have the nerve to have a three tiered goal plan, I think, is fantastic. Right. And then being able to reconcile yourself. Well, you know, you win some or lose some. You got 66 percent of this done. <laughs> I think I think that's fantastic. But then the rules did change and aviation, albeit it was the third on the list. It became the primary when and why. Well, you know, it was always a primary. Uh, okay. As far as I can remember, Mario, I wanted to fly, but I didn't, my, mm. my parents didn't know anyone. I didn't even know anyone who worked at the airport. Mm. Uh, and so to expose me to that environment, you know, I, as a child, I, it was Superman, it was Star Wars. Uh, mm. It was anything and everything I could do to think about being airborne. I built paper airplanes and, and made them and I attached straws to them. So aviation was always, you know, in the back of my mind, I just had no idea how to do it. Uh, so mm. it does speak to the idea that if, if you could see it or be close to someone who's doing it um, and that can expose you to it, then you can be it yourself. And mm. the Air Force Academy created that opportunity for me to see it, for me to be close to it and exposed to it and experience it. And uh, it took uh, the change of a policy. It took the needs of the Air Force to change. That created the opportunity. But had I not pursued that goal, had I not pursued that passion with the hope that, you know, in my mind, I was my plan was to study engineering, to get close mm. enough to it, that if I'm a good enough cockpit designer, someone will give me a chance. So that absolutely spark this bright light off in the distance that made me feel like I could accomplish it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It fit perfectly with the wild idea that I could get all three of uh, those dreams accomplished in one sitting. And um, it turned out the right way. And the interesting part about that is that for the Air Force perspective, it's my goodness, if that policy hadn't changed, they would have had definitely had slim pickings for, for pilots. Because I'm not sure many people who consistently naturally have 2020 vision. So, 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 you know, that's fantastic. How, how long did you stay at the Air Force? Because I'm very you went on to get some imp impressive academic accolades, including uh, an MBA and including uh, a including a well the two masters that you went on to get right did that happen in tandem with the air force or post air force you know it's a combination of the two mario i was uh i, I graduated from the air force academy in 1999 i immediately uh, like every other cadet received my commission as a lieutenant second lieutenant in the air force and then from there uh, i waited for an opportunity to go to pilot training uh, i flew uh, I graduated from pilot training about a year and a half or so from graduating at the academy and then uh, started flying in the Air Force initially as an instructor pilot and then uh, transitioning to fly fighters. Um, the end of my fighter tour ended up being about two weeks shy of 10 years and um, that was the time where I, I elected to uh, separate away from the active duty Air Force and that's when I really put a, a, a lot more effort into transitioning from being a, a pilot traveling around the world, flying Gulf Streams, and uh, I flew around the world and, and deployed in defense of the nation. But at this point in time, it was really about how do I do what excites me again? Yeah, and yeah. Sales was it, and that's why I went and got the MBA from the University of South Carolina. Uh, I finished another degree from Embry-Riddle. I, I now sit on the board for the worldwide campus for Embry-Riddle. Um, and, and so it's it's just been a, a great and phenomenal journey, and I've loved every step of it. How many years did you spend in the sales piece of it? I think it was Hyundai, Hyundai uh, Aviation you worked at for a while. Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. How many years did you do that? Uh, 
Uh, so I was in a, a sales support role at Gulfstream. That was my introduction to private aviation and the mm. sales and the business of private aviation. You know, that's Gulfstream. That's Gulfstream Aerospace. That's correct. Gulfstream. I uh, know them well. Did a did an event for them several years back. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, beautiful machines. The most opulent and, and technical aircraft in the world. Um, longest range, fastest flying, amazing machinery. Uh, but, Top dollar too. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're talking fifty million and up. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, and and it was a great experience, but it, it taught me that aviation is far more than piloting and maintenance and um, maintenance support and fuel. Um, there's such a big business behind aviation, and the sales piece of it was the part that was most attractive to me. Mm. Um, and so I, I found an opportunity to sell airplanes with Honda Aircraft Company. Uh, I was selling for the eastern half of the region, eastern U.S., uh, for mainly the northeast, and um, saw an opportunity in the market that said, man, kind of like those, those, those three-tiered uh, effort that I was after, those three goals I was at for, after for college, I, I can achieve what I want personally, I can achieve what I want for my family, and I can achieve what I want professionally if I start my own business. So. Um, and, and that gap in the market that I recognized is, is where that came about. And, and that's what takes me to my next question. So Jet It and the European counterpart Jet Club, you just teased it a bit, but take me further into the think tank status of starting Jet It. Yeah, so um, Jet It came about from just being a typical type A salesman personality. I would go into conversations always trying to figure out how can I advance this process forward? How can I get a deal done uh, to, to essentially do more for my family, do more for myself professionally and to achieve that win personally? Um, obviously, you can only sell something that someone wants or needs. Yeah. In those conversations, time and again, uh, I would hear that, Glenn, I, I love the airplane. I want the airplane, but I don't need the airplane for 365 days out of the year. Can you help me find a partner? Can you help me find a way to offset my cost of ownership in some form or fashion? And mm. the business idea came from those conversations. Time and again, understanding what their needs were, understanding what their wants were, and realizing that there was nothing in the marketplace that was providing it. And so that that's where Jetic came about. I talked with my co-founder, uh, Vishal Hidamit, who runs Jet Club. And he said the same thing, you know, Glenn, I've been flying all around the Asia Pacific region, setting up the Honda sales network, and I'm hearing all the same things. And so we decided to partner together, pull some fundraising in. Um, I, I spent the better part of two years building the business model, a lot of perseverance and resilience, a lot of determination. And here we are today. Yeah. And, and so what does the structure, how deep does the structure go if you were to break it down? Because it's you know, it's interesting to me. You think about, you know, vacation spots and people say, you know, the whole timeshare idea is that, you know, gee, well, I don't want to owe luxury all, all year long, but what can I do to get a splice of it when I need it? Right. So so take me in the day to day, I guess the, the, the transaction that would happen. Do people essentially what's the difference between leasing and this particular owner stru owner structure? Yeah. So in you know, it is very much like you described. I just need this piece of luxury, time being that luxury that people are buying into with our program. I just need it um, a, a little bit throughout the year. I don't need it every day. Um, so it is in some cases like a timeshare, mm. um, and but it is titled to you. And that's where it becomes different from a lease or, or some other form of ownership. Um, you own it. It's titled to you. There are some tremendous tax advantages associated with that. Um, the current tax code allows you to write off 100% of the acquisition if you're using it for a business um, oh, wow. as a business tool. Um, so sometimes you see people put stickers on their vehicles or they, they buy a vehicle exclusively for driving to and from work or traveling around states. Um, you know, that you're getting a write off with that. If you're buying a heavy piece of equipment like a big truck, uh, and you're driving a truck uh, full time as your career profession, um, you know, there are, are tax benefits to that. And so it's just the same when you own a piece of one of our aircraft, um, you can have that same tax advantage. That's that's fantastic. So how many years are we are we used to the it's, you said two years. So does, does that mean that the 
a company has been up and running for two years or that was a two years of work footwork that you put into it? It was two years of just hard nosed day to day effort to build a business plan. You know, aviation mm -hmm. is such a dynamic industry and there's so many variables. You know, we, we always think about the weather or the aircraft uh, maintainability, uh, but there's so many more variables that influence uh, the business of aviation. And so it took the better part to plan it like I would plan a mission when I was flying fighters. And the, the end result of that, Mario, is uh, we found a business model that works. Uh, it's been effective. Uh, it's been supportive for meeting the needs of our share owners. Um, and it's changing how people travel. It's changing the marketplace. There are already people who are imitating what we're doing uh, and trying to copy our business model. So we're flattered by it. Sounds good. On the commercial side, several of the nation's largest airlines have already started canceling flights for the vacation summer period. When the pandemic started, about 13,000 pilots were sent home for early retirement. And that 13,000 pilot shortage still exists today. So obviously, you've given a lot of aviation opinion right across the, the media sphere. So. In your opinion, based on what's going on today, I mean, it's it, unfortunately it's uh, it's a deplorable state out there, right? Because of inflation, also because of that shortage that I just mentioned in terms of pilots, et cetera. How does that speak to you with having such insight into aviation? Yeah, it, look, it, it's hard. <laughs> it, you know, talking about those variables that we we were talking about just a moment ago, Mario. It, it, pilots are a big piece of it. Probably one of the most important elements in the whole uh, spectrum of, of aviation. Um, and when there's a shortage at the airlines, there's a shortage everywhere. And so it, it creates all kinds of new challenges. Uh, but we, we, are, we find ourselves as, in a, as a creative solution for helping grow experienced pilots, uh, for helping feed those airlines and cargo operators that are out there. But also we, we find that you know, it's up to us to create a positive solution for those individuals to want to be a destination um, for aviation. It, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, but yeah. We're managing and we're excited about the future for companies like ours. What would the what would the and I'm asking you to sort of conjecture in terms of an example, but obviously every contract would be different. But what would the theoretical costs of, say, owning a jet through your business model be, say, if someone wanted to own it for a quarter of the year or a quarter of a quarter of the year, that sort of thing. Are we, because again, the whole point is that, gee, I don't want to spend the $50 million, which is the baseline price, to get a personal jet. To what degree is it, is it advantageous for you in terms of the cost savings that would be passed on to the customer yeah, who would go with your business model? Yeah, I, I think the, the better way to think about it is, you know, the, and COVID is a perfect example of, of how to think of it. Um, you know, there, we've all probably known someone who has lost a loved one due to COVID or at some point in time in life, we've, always, we've all lost someone that we've loved. Um, when you think about it that way and what you would pay, what you would do to get that time back uh, with that individual, um, it becomes readily apparent how valuable a program like Jetit is. That said, you know, we had one individual in the real estate space. Um, in one day, he flew uh, to five different cities. Mm. It was less than 4, 000, four hours of flight time and less than 8,000 total dollars. Uh, that would have taken him three days to do and about half the cost of $4,000 had he do a, done that same trip commercially. Oh, now, wow. when you think about whether that's to go see family, to go see four or five different family members in five different cities on the same day, or if that's from a business standpoint, like this situation, what is the return on investment? Mm. Uh, return on investment to spend $1,800 an hour to fly and have a private jet show up to pick you up, take you where you want to go, get you where you want to be, and wait for you if need be, or, or come back and get you a, a couple of days later. Um, it, it's just an unmatched value uh, across any spectrum. And when you apply it to the value of time, you know, people always talk about time as money, but until you really apply it to what you would do with that time if you had it back. Mm. Okay. That's powerful. That's absolutely powerful. 
So, so in, in the plan is to obviously revolutionize private aviation one by one. And earlier you teased the fact that other companies are looking at your, at your model and you guys are, 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 are flattered by it. So to so what degree, I guess, what is the overall plan for Jetit and, and Jet Club next? How far are you hoping to go? You know, our, our going in premise was simply this, that uh, history always repeats itself. And when yes. you look at the history of transportation, people are looking for more autonomy and efficiency. Yeah. Um, if, if you think about it in terms of um, you know, the automobiles, uh, if you, or, or better yet, if you think about it, you know, three, 400 years ago, if you had the means, you had a horse and carriage. Yeah, you could feed the horse, you could buy the horse, or at least you had the time to break the horse. Um, you could have a carriage. And that's how you got around. If you didn't have a horse and carriage, you probably didn't have means which meant you were walking from A to B. Those are your only two options. Yeah. Fast forward to present day, those who have means are looking for the same autonomy and efficiency in how they travel. You talk yeah. about the airlines canceling flights. You're losing autonomy. If the airlines cancel a flight, you're stuck in the airport. You're stuck in the airport, or you're just not going that day. You're going to miss yeah. it. If you are flying on the airlines, you're going to miss out on half of your day because you've got to stop at a major hub airport, um, or you've got to drive from your final destination to where you're trying to get to uh, because it's not close to a, a major airport. You know, the, the airlines only cover 5% of the airports throughout the country. Uh, people don't oftentimes realize that, but there's still 95% um, or, or another 95% of airports across the country spread out closer to the destination that people were trying to get to. You know, it's that autonomy and efficiency mm -hmm. that we built our business on. It's the human behavior of autonomy and efficiency and the need for transportation yeah. uh, that we're based upon. And so we'll let the market decide where we are in the coming years, uh, we have to perform, we have to execute. Yeah. Uh, if we're able to continue executing, um, we expect there to be a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity for us. And continuing in that analogous voice, I'm looking at something like, you know, for me, it's, it's you know, I'm totally blind. And sometimes that, you know, I, I, I would prefer to have a personal driver and it would be the difference between, you know, having a luxury car pick you up and just kind of paying 100, 150 bucks or just kind of doing it the regular public conveyance way. I'm wondering if, and, and let me know if in my novice mind of aviation, if I'm going too far, but I'm wondering if it's possible in the future to get to that particular point where at least, you know, a family that is of, of reasonable means or at least, you know, a high middle class could say, you know what, for this particular trip, I don't want to deal with it. You know, we'll, we'll you know, pay an extra thousand bucks per person or an extra twelve hundred dollars per person so we can go across the pond by ourselves, you know, without having to deal with the hubbub of the commercial experience. It does, is my novice mind thinking too far or is that an idea of, of where you're hoping the industry does go in, in privatizing aviation? Not, not at all, Mario. You are right on track. That is definitely the way to go. Um, that's what we'd love to see, uh, to speak to that. Uh, we have ordered and are on order for a number of electric aircraft. Um, they are not yet certified. It's with Bi Aerospace and it's the E-Flyer 800. It's an eight passenger electric aircraft. Um, wow. That, that flies the same speed as a lot of combustion aircraft today. Uh, electric- just, Are they just as loud? <laughs> uh, they're actually very quiet, extremely quiet because you don't have that, uh, that combustion happening. Yeah, yeah. And so you really just have the air noise around the aircraft, which in some cases might be a little eerie uh, because it's not what we're used to. But the, the fact of the matter is uh, to be able to electrify aviation when half of the cost of flying an airplane is fuel. And so mm. in today's case, uh, it's two thirds of the cost because fuel prices mm. are so high. So mm. if, if that is the majority of the cost and I can remove that from the operation cost, I can then bring down the overall value or the mm. cost to the customer, increasing the value of the experience. At the end of the day, though, it's about physics. Yeah. So right now, combustion is the only way for us to go as fast as we can. So if speed and efficiency are important to us, then what we do is, is a critical piece to it. But yes, we're definitely driving and moving in the direction of bringing down the cost of aviation as quickly as possible. 
an electric aircraft. Oh my God, that opens up a whole, oh God, we'd have to talk more about that but at, the, some, at some of the time because I have so many scientific questions about, well, well, you know, how many batteries are on board and, and <laughs> what's the, what, what are the backup systems, et cetera. So, obviously, since it's just electric dependency, that would be, I, I'm, I think it's awesome and I'm fascinated by that. So I'd, I'd love to uh, at some point have a, have a deeper scientific discussion with you around physics and and all of that type of stuff. I think it's I think it's very interesting. And this month is definitely the month of Father's Day. Uh, how you doing as a dad, Glenn? <laughs> I'm happy. My oldest is a violinist. Uh, she's off to study school at the New England Conservatory. Uh, I'm very proud of the effort that she and her sister have put into their, their instruments. Uh, awesome. My younger daughter is a cellist. Um, so I, I've loved being a dad. I'm sad to see them growing up and going off uh, but you know I, i've done my best and you know my wife has done an amazing job with them just the same i think that so put it in the medical meta, metaphorical experience of aviation where you've well prepared them to take a decent flight so i think that's that's quite excellent well definitely we look forward to being able to stay in contact with you glenn um, i want to thank you for joining us in the Jin Leong circle today where can everyone follow you you know, I'm, I'm on all of the various different social media platforms. Um, typically, most people find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Aviator Glenn uh, is how you can find me uh, or just Glenn Gonzalez uh, with JetIt. And our, our JetIt website is just gojetit.com. Fantastic, everyone. Well, gojetit.com indeed. Uh, we've been talking to the head of JetIt, a uh, private aviation company this afternoon, and uh, we'll be in touch. Again, Glenn, thank you so much for your inspiration, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. For All right, see you next time, everybody. Does anyone still believe in paradise? Or is it only me? Do you believe in so far, love?